Welcome to Friday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live here on Giants.com as well as the mobile app. He's Paul Dottino. I'm Lance Meadow with you for the next 60 minutes. It is presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football Giants. Multiple ways you can interact with us here on the program. Give us a ring, 201-939-4513. You can also hit us up on Twitter, hashtag Giants Chat, directly to us as well. I'm at Lance Meadow, one word, last name, M-E-D-O-W. He is at Giants W-F-A-N. And as a reminder, you can find the archive of this show and our entire podcast network on the Giants mobile app, podcast platforms everywhere, and at Giants.com slash podcast. So we prepare to survive the weekend. Then Monday, the entertaining aspects of the NFL offseason begin, Paul. (laughs) The start of free agency and players going every which way. Now, speaking of that, where I want to lead off with, and once again, this is not anything that the Giants are confirming, but we're not naive. There are reports out there about Russell Wilson, who is free to meet with whatever team he likes because the Broncos have had conversations with him he has received Denver's blessing. They're going to go their separate ways. So Russell Wilson is officially a free agent in terms of being able to talk. And there are multiple reports that he is chatting with the Giants as well as the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I'm sure there's going to be maybe several other teams that perhaps throw their names into the hat. Because Russell Wilson, just from a big picture perspective, Paul, falls into the category of what you and I were talking about on yesterday's program. Right. members of the audience that may have not tuned in. And we were talking about where the Giants are going to go with the quarterback position in general. We weren't necessarily just focusing on free agency. It was a combination of free agency and the draft. But Russell Wilson fits my profile of the insurance policy, polished veteran quarterback who has plenty of starting experience. And God forbid Daniel Jones got hurt and could not get through a stretch or the season that you would feel okay handing the reins over to him to run your offense. That's the type of guy that I think has value for the Giants to target. Well, I think the significant uh, portion of this equation is the fact that you don't have to pay him but pennies on the dollar because he's already got, what was it, almost $39 million, I think, guaranteed to him by the Broncos who made him a yep. street-free agent by, by setting him free. So, in all reality, you know, he can become a $40 million quarterback this year, even if you're only paying him like a million and a half. (laughs) Because the salaries are offset. Basically, anything that a new team pays him is less that Denver owes him. That's the way that it works. So, you know, if you're any team in the league, it's incredibly um, low in terms of the economic risk that you might want to take in signing a Russell Wilson. Now, there's no question he's on the down. Uh, you know, mid-30s, I know quarterbacks have now proven they can play till till 40 and, and, and even then some. He's definitely on the down. Uh, but at the same time, you get a starter who has a pedigree, a solid resume. He has been a winner. Uh, and you're getting him for, again pennies on the dollar because of today's salary cap rules and the way free agency works if you can get a guy with that kind of resume for dirt cheap there's a lot to be said for that I mean that is a that is a huge part of the equation whether or not you think he can still play at a very high level is almost immaterial because for example there's a bunch of veteran quarterbacks in this league right now who are making three, four, five, six, even upwards of almost $10 million a year. Right? Sure. A bunch of them. Yeah. A bunch of them don't have anywhere near the resume that Russell Wilson has. So even if you believe that he is way past his prime, think about it. You've got the potential to maybe get him for max two mil. Because he doesn't need the money from you. He's collecting it from Denver. Well, you would think money is not a priority for him. Let's put it that way. So, I mean, think about that. You're you're getting a guy with this kind of resume for less than probably almost every other experienced veteran quarterback out there who hasn't done even a speck of what he's done in this league. So I understand why any team would want to at least talk to him and explore the possibility and figure out what it is he's thinking in his mind. What is he looking for at his next stop? I absolutely understand that. 
Well, just to give you an idea as a means of comparison, Tyrod Taylor, who had signed a two-year contract. He was for, six mil last year, wasn't yeah, he? about 11 mil. So, you know, just under six per year. So just under six per year versus if Russell Wilson, once again, is not prioritizing money, and we're assuming that given what Denver owes him and that the money's offset. So you could maybe cut what Taylor took up to about half that, if not even more, just hypothetically speaking. So it doesn't put an immense amount of strain on the salary cap no. for a position to me that I've always said is a priority. The backup quarterback position is overlooked way too much by teams across the board. He's not a durability question mark. Russell Wilson has held up for the most part. He has. Even with Denver. It's a question of, as you mentioned, you know, productivity. And, the and what does he want? Factor. What is he looking for, too? Sure. Well, I would think if you're Russell Wilson, he's definitely still looking for if there's that opportunity to start or at least compete to be a starter. I mean, mm -hmm. he's a competitor, Paul. I find it hard to believe that he woke up overnight and said, I'm content. Oh, he's not Marcus Mariota. Yeah, a clipboard <laughs> Marcus Mariota right now is, is a backup quarterback in this league. He is not getting a chance to start. So I don't think Russell Wilson has transitioned to that mindset. That's number one. Then number two, does he want to go to a team that he feels has a chance to win? I mean, given what he experienced in Seattle, I don't know. If you were just to compare, okay, the two teams that are reported to have interest in him, which is the Giants and the Steelers, well, Pittsburgh track record-wise in winning is very different than the Giants. Mm -hmm. So if winning is a priority, then you give the significant edge to the Steelers. Then let's look at it from an opportunity standpoint. Okay, Giants, you got Daniel Jones coming off a significant injury. Joe Shane has made it clear they need to prioritize that position and they need to bring somebody in who could very well run the offense. So you also look at Daniel Jones's track record in terms of injuries. Not to once again wish anybody to get hurt, but I'm sure Russell Wilson would weigh that versus Kenny Pickett, okay? A younger quarterback. Granted, he was banged up this season. He did get hurt. He did get hurt, mm -hmm. but not the same track record of being sidelined as Daniel Jones. So are you looking to say, where's the pathway for me to get on the field? And once again, not wishing anybody to get hurt, you may say the Giants are a bit more attractive than the Steelers. However, the main difference is Pittsburgh could go to Russell Wilson and say, Kenny Pickett's coming off an injury plague season. Even when Kenny came back, remember Mason Rudolph remained the starter and did nice in terms of helping the Steelers win yes. and ultimately make the playoffs. Pittsburgh could say, we're going to bring you in. You're going to compete with Kenny Pickett. It's going to be an open competition, whereas the Giants could be more of the mindset, Daniel's the guy, assuming he's healthy, and everybody else coming in is competing for the number two job. Those are also different scenarios there. Sure. That I just laid out. Sure. And, you know, the other thing that you have to keep in mind here, too, is he's already gone through two years in Denver with a different system that, you know, we heard a lot of rumblings that he wasn't a good fit for the system. I'm sure that Russell Wilson's going to make sure that his next stop is a place where he's also comfortable with what they're running. He doesn't need to and hear... And vice versa. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't need to hear, you know, and go through what he went through with Sean Payton in Denver this past year where apparently there was a definite disconnect between what the quarterback and what the head coach wanted to run. And I think that also is going back to Wilson's mindset <clears throat> of... Remember, Sean was with Drew Brees for years. And what is Drew known for? getting rid of the ball quickly. No doubt. Right? Being no precise. Doubt. Russell's more of the off-schedule quarterback. Right, Paul? He's the scrambler. He is the furthest thing from quick game that you're going to find. So, I mean, that alone, when Sean took over the job, made people wonder, at least I was thinking, well, I mean, from a fit system, you wonder, is this going to work? Statistically, though, speaking, I think this gets buried and overlooked. Russ actually had a pretty good statistical season with Denver, all things aside. He had 26 touchdowns and eight interceptions. He completed 66% of his passes. Solid Sign season. Sign me up, Paul. Sign me up for that as a backup Solid quarterback. Solid season. You're going to tell me you wouldn't take that? Solid season. And Absolutely. And that gets dismissed to me because of, once again, the fit that wasn't ideal. Right. I concur with that. But I still think there's gas in the tank. And, and by the way, yeah. we should add a tribute uh, Adam Schefter. 
of uh, ESPN. Right. But others have since sort of followed right. up. But he, he was reports. the one, I believe, who may have first had it Chef and DK. and had a, a photo that a fan apparently took at Newark Airport of Russell Wilson Flying out at to the Pittsburgh. airport on yeah. his way to meet the Steelers. So this is not something we're making up or something that we're even confirming. We're simply talking to you about a report that's out there, and we want to make sure we give credit to, to uh, ESPN and Schefter uh, for the gentleman who has unearthed uh, this story. And so, uh, you know, whatever happens from there, happens from there. Schefter also used the term exploratory meeting with the Giants. Well, compared to we the just Steelers. laid out a whole bunch of questions that you'd yeah. have to get answered before you even begin to discuss any kind of deal. Well, but I just, I chuckle when I hear that term. Couldn't you argue every meeting is exploratory with any player, Paul? I mean, aren't you sitting down no, and you're discussing because, the situation? No, because there are, there are some meetings where you've already got the framework worked out before the guy comes in, okay. and now you're just making the nitty-gritty, dotting the I's, crossing the T's, and you really kind of know what everybody wants to do. Um, exploratory to me is more of a feel out process. It's more preliminary. There's much less substance to it. It certainly means that you're not at all close to making a deal. It's not like, oh, he, we're not letting him out of the building without a contract. Exploratory is the exact opposite of that. Well, but I guess as a means of comparison, and this is where I'm getting at, what's the difference between, based on reports, what the Giants are discussing versus what the Steelers are discussing with Russell Wilson? Because Russ and the Steelers was not quote-unquote, exploratory. So is that then to make the assumption they're further along in terms of they may dialogue? They may have had more dialogue on Zoom or on a telephone call. Or maybe the agent spoke with them a little bit yeah. more. I, may, maybe there was much more of a feeling out process that they had already gone through. Look, however you want to characterize it, um, it is what it is, and we'll just file it in the back of our minds and uh, keep the radar out for it. And that's all you can do. Well, but I think the means of us bringing it up is a nice follow-up and transition from the conversation we were having yesterday because mm -hmm. we were talking about the different the different avenues that the Giants can take to address the quarterback position. And I'm a big proponent of a veteran backup quarterback holding a great deal of value. So I think Russell Wilson fits the bill and then some given, as you were talking about, his vast resume as a starter. And we're not talking about the Russell Wilson from 2013-14 when he was helping the Seahawks get to Super Bowls, but you're still looking, at least based on the numbers game, a guy that could come in, run an offense, and make plays. And that's what you need. Mm -hmm. You need a reliable arm and a reliable decision maker in today's NFL. There were too many, and I know people turn to 2023. Well, the last few seasons, Paul, there's been an abundance of injuries to starting quarterbacks, and some teams have positioned themselves great because they've had that reliable backup who comes in, weathers the storm. Other teams, not so much. And I don't think it's a coincidence that when you look at last season, Pittsburgh is one of the few teams that was able to keep their head above water, despite the fact that they had a few different starting quarterbacks. Most of the other teams, you know, they went through their fair share of ups and downs. It was a roller coaster, and as a result, they did miss out on the postseason. And, I mean, granted, we don't even have to look at the rest of the league. The Giants are an example. They lost Daniel Jones, right? A few starters came in, and they ultimately missed the playoffs. Now, there were issues even before the game of musical chairs began, but it just goes to show you when you have that recipe in place that can provide some stability, it can really do wonders for your team. And New Orleans is a good example, by the way, when Drew Brees went down and Teddy Bridgewater stepped in yeah. for him, and he went 5-0 and as yeah. the starter. And by the way, Bridgewater is one of those guys who fits into your category. Absolutely. Unfortunately, he's retired. But yes, he's the guy that fits my bill, without a and doubt. And so does Mariota, to be honest. Yes, Mariota does, once again. He's yeah. another guy. Sure. He's you know, a veteran if, journeyman who has been adapted to this role. Yeah. yeah. You know, if that's where the Giants decide to go. Uh, again, we have no idea. And that's the beauty of it. Because... The Giants have so many doors that they can open in regards to this. It is not an automatic, contrary to what so many hordes of people want to say, that they've got to draft one in the first round, or they've got to draft one at number six, or they've got to trade up to get one. That could not be further from the truth. The, the, the fact is, they have multiple doors that they could logically decide to open any one of those 
And that's really what makes this draft intriguing, to be frank with you. Because they could go like what we talked about. Or they could go and draft, let's say, a third, fourth, or fifth round project quarterback. They could do that too. There's a lot of ways they can go here. Or they could just say, you know what? We're happy with what we got. We're just going to we're going to uh, make, and I don't think it'll happen, okay? I don't think, based on what Joe Shane has said, he says we have to address the quarterback room. Yep. So I don't think they'll go status quo. But it is an option. Well, they could bring back DeVito and Tyrod Taylor. Sure. They could do that. Well, Taylor fits the bill of a veteran quarterback, and he knows the system. They too. could go status quo. That is a door they could open, folks. Please don't discount that. It is a possibility. Well, and that's why I say whether it's Taylor returning or a new face, I would be personally surprised if there's not a veteran that is brought in via free agency. That's all I'll say. You could go in the draft a variety of different directions. As you mentioned, we know DeVito's under contract. I would be surprised, though, if some move is not made in free agency, whether it's a new veteran or Taylor returning. Because I think that yeah. Joe Shane values that. Mm-hmm. That's just my interpretation. And I think it's a necessity on the roster. So I'd be surprised if that's the one door that remains shut, I guess is what I'm saying in response mm-hmm. to everything that you were talking about. I think it's a billion to one shot that they go into opening day with Daniel Jones and Tommy DeVito as the only two quarterbacks in the building. I totally agree with you. I'm just saying that I think one of the three options on the roster to me, is going to be a more established veteran than Tommy DeVito, is all I'm saying. Because, remember, you go in the draft, that's not a veteran. Whether it's a right. third round or fourth round, I mean, that's pretty much well, if you, a raw individual. If no you take you a project quarterback, then Tommy DeVito probably is the two. Uh, you, and, and, you know, you mentioned something to me yesterday. And let me, let me just revisit this. Sure. <laughs> you talked about... Could you possibly keep three on the 53? That's right. And I thought about that last night. And I'm glad I'm on your mind in the evening. But go ahead. Yes. No, it was just. Oh, just kidding. It was Hard just. Time. Yeah. I started to chew on it more and more and more and more. That's good. I like to make you think. And what I decided was that if they do go the veteran route, okay, that's got, that's got a real possibility. Real possibility of three quarterbacks yeah. being kept on the 53. Yeah. Okay. Just want to make sure I understand. I think so. Yeah. You, that's what I laid out. So you don't have I, to convince I, me. I think that is more likely than if they draft somebody. So if they draft somebody, you're saying Daniel Jones and the drafted quarterback, and then you take your chances on the practice squad, which to me is sensible. I think, yeah. If they, if they, they, pick, they pick the draft pick... He, he's on the 53. They try to sneak Tommy through. I don't necessarily think that's going to work, okay? But I think that's what wind up happening. And whether or not he gets taken, then you might have, who knows, Jacob Eason may wind up coming back, or Mark, Matt Barkley comes back and winds up being the three, okay? But you'll only have two on your 53, and then if Jones were not to be able to play, you'd have to then go and make a move. Because I don't think the project that's on the roster is necessarily going to be ready right away to play. Now, if you go the other way and do what you had suggested about signing the veteran, well, now I think you probably keep the veteran on the 53. And if you want to draft a prospect... Now that prospect is also going to have to be on the well, 53. Well, he has to. I mean, especially if because you use a top you're, fourth you're, round pick. You let's can't, say. You can't expose a pick oh, sure. to the practice squad. Yeah. He, he, he's not making it. So one of the many options, as we've laid out, you can sign a veteran backup and you could also draft a project. But if you do that... Now you absolutely have to have three quarterbacks on your 53. And I do think that is more of a viable option than I thought earlier before we had that conversation yesterday. I do think maybe that is another door that is in the back of the room. And that's exactly how I see it. Because to piggyback off of your point, I would be okay rolling the dice with Tommy DeVito being back on the practice squad. I'd 
be okay. Meaning if you lose him, you lose him. But I think the chances of not losing him are greater than anybody else that you would roll the dice and put on the practice guard, whether it's the established veteran you sign or, to your point, somebody who you draft, which would be pointless. Because if you take a quarterback in the third or the fourth round, there's you a have to keep them. Somebody you else have to keep them on their board. You have to keep them. So you don't have a choice. So I'd be okay rolling the dice, and I think that they can live with See, that. See, now the reason you would do that is because you're signing the older veteran to protect yourself against Jones's lack of durability this year but you're also drafting the project quarterback because you're looking at him as a potential real uh, uh, sleeper chip for the future. That's why you would do that. I don't think, I don't, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but I don't know that Tommy DeVito's upside. He's an undrafted rookie free agent last year. I don't know that anybody is going to equate his upside to, let's say, a third or fourth round draft I'm pick you. that you might take this year. Yep. So if you go that way, you're now taking a two-pronged approach. You're protecting yourself this year, and you're also potentially having a diamond in the rough for the future. And if you're going to take that philosophical approach, I think Tommy DeVito gets squeezed out. And remember, the veteran quarterback in your scenario, it's not just the matter of he's an insurance policy to step in if Daniel Jones can't hold up at some point in the season. He also may be a guy ready to go who's needed in week one. It's more of a reason why you can't. He may have to be. From the 50s. He may have to be. And once again, anyway, we're getting ahead of ourselves because we don't know what's going to happen with Daniel Jones and his rehab. But all of those scenarios are situations that the Giants definitely need to discuss. All right. A few reminders before we open up the phone lines. Giants Auto Podcast. You can check that out on your favorite podcast platform. You could also go to Giants.com slash podcast. As we look ahead to the 2024 season, you can take your fandom to the next level with a season ticket membership. Stay connected to the club all year round, not just on game days. Memberships are now available for the 2024 campaign. To learn more about all the exclusive member benefits, visit Giants.com slash tickets. Limited inventory is available. And the Giants official connected TV streaming app, Giants TV brings you original video content, game highlights on demand and direct to big blue fans. Giants TV, it's free. It's on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and the Giants mobile app. All right, let's open up the phone lines. We've got Jamal in Charlotte joining us here on BBKL. What's happening, Jamal? What do you got for us? It's Jerome and Charlie. Jerome. I don't know how Jamal <laughs> transferred over from Jerome. It'll be a mystery we'll try to solve off the air. But welcome aboard, Jerome. <laughs> Hello. Hi, guys. I will take the Joe. fall on that, Jerome. I'm All sorry. Good. I, I misheard you. I wasn't going to throw anybody under the bus. No, it was me. So, I'll take, I'll okay. take the fall. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Um, I just have... Um, I've been following the draft and y'all processing on everything. I was just wondering, um, out of the first round and second round picks that y'all suggest that, you know, is a possibility, um, when you you look at quarterbacks like uh, Russell Wilson that was in the third, uh, Prescott was in the fourth, who is your list of sleepers? that, you know, can blossom as well as, even though I hate to give Prescott credit, you know, um, playing with that. <laughs> well, what do you mean? Sleepers meaning that are currently in the NFL or in this year's draft class? I lost you. This, this year's draft class. Oh, okay. Well, who, who is um, the sleeper, the list of sleepers that is – third, maybe fourth, that can can blow up and be well-named starter that can possibly, you know, like uh, Prairie and uh, with the 49ers. Um, Purdy, yeah. Purdy, yeah. The, the guys who I would kind of be putting on my radar if you wanted to get one of those projects, okay, one of those diamonds in the rough, Spencer Rattler from South Carolina for me is a guy who I would absolutely look at. Now, I met him at the Combine. He is on the smaller side. He's not very tall. He's more of a smaller quarterback. I usually six one. I usually shy away from those guys. But my goodness, uh, there's a lot to like about him. And it is his size that, that really downgrades him as much as anything else. Michael Pratt from uh, Tulane, 
Uh, he is another one who he's got. He's six three now. He's a bigger guy. Now Tulane, um, you know, they don't have this this great aerial downfield passing attack because Pratt uh, does not have the strongest arm. His his arm strength is a bit lacking. That would be a reason why he would be down further in the draft. The other guy who I'd be interested in, and there are two who to me are really dark horse candidates. And I say this for various reasons. Joe Milton out of Tennessee. You mentioned him yesterday. I mentioned him yesterday. Yeah. Uh, he has only started 17 games at the Division I college level. So he is as raw as an onion. Okay? He needs an awful lot of work. But physically, he is a big strapping dude. I mean, this this guy is built like, like a tight end. He's got length. Uh, he's got an absolute rifle of an arm. Um, I met him at the Combine, very poised, really enjoyed talking to him. Uh, that would be a guy, and of course we know about Tennessee's route tree and stuff, so we understand all that stuff. But if you want a real dark horse project who has been through some adversity and, and needs a lot of experience and would be willing to sit probably for two years, Joe Milton out of Tennessee would be a guy you might want to think about on the third day. You know, maybe fourth, fourth, fourth or fifth round. I'll give you one more. Uh, Jordan Travis. I have him here on my, on Florida my board. State. Florida State. We know about the broken leg. Yep. Okay. Coming off a significant injury. Now, that's another guy who isn't as big. Okay. He's, he's not Milton. Milton physically, when you see Joe Milton, you're impressed right away. Okay. Because the physical stature of him and the way he carries himself. Uh the Florida State kid, Travis, he's more along Rattler. He's a, he's a smaller, more compact guy. But, you know, he's done an awful lot of good things. I'm looking at the, the research I did on him. Really good season. Three-plus years as a starter uh, between Louisville and, uh, and uh, Florida State. Um, and, you know, 39 total starts overall, 29 victories. At the NCAA level, I go by the Parcells rules. You know, that's that's a big deal for me. Uh, he passes all those boxes. He checks all those boxes. So Jordan Travis might be another guy. I, I think Milton has more physical tools than, than Travis does. But those would be the guys. I just gave you four guys. And Rattler, he was the MVP of the Senior Bowl. Yeah. And also, similar to Jordan Travis, was at two programs. He was at Oklahoma, then he went to South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about an individual. Well, Milton started at Michigan, too. Has 42 starts. No, but I'm just, I'm using that Parcells school of thought to apply to Rattler as well. Three of the four guys I just named for you, Pratt's the only one who was at Tulane at one school. Three of the other four guys all had been transfers. They had all had multiple programs. And if you're also looking at more prominent programs, clearly Travis and Rattler jump off the page. Not to say that guys can't thrive if they're at well, lesser Tennessee's programs a, in terms Tennessee's of Tennessee's a big houses. program. No, ten, but I'm, I'm just saying that those two guys in particular were at multiple big programs, yeah. not just necessarily. So does, does that help you at all? Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, are you talking about guys that can push um, um, or quickly move past um, the veto that, that we have now? Well, you would think... Yeah, I don't. Think I mean, why, why? Why? If these guys are dark horse, you know, start of day three picks, and and Tommy DeVito was an undrafted rookie free agent, you would have to believe that coming in, they would they would immediately have a leg up, even though they don't have the experience of playing in the league like Tommy does. Uh, they come in with a higher a higher grade or a higher pedigree. Yeah, if you're going to take a quarterback in the fourth or the fifth round, I would assume you feel there's more upside than an undrafted guy. If that was the case, then just wait till the draft is over and sign one of these guys if perhaps they get through. Okay. I appreciate y'all. And yep. y'all enjoy y'all weekend. All right. You as well. For, uh, free agency. Yep. Thanks, Jerome. Appreciate the phone call. Now, again, th- those four guys that I just mentioned, these guys are all project quarterbacks, and their ceiling is unknown. You know, sure. will they just be – Good backups in the league? Will they be okay starters? Will they be somewhat better than okay starters? 
Um, no one's going to mistake those four guys for franchise quarterbacks. No, that's why. They, that's, that's why, why they're, they're not in the drafted. first round, comp, yeah. you know, conversation. They're not. They're not. Yeah. But you know, again, we also talked about yesterday how twelve of the last twenty-seven starting quarterbacks of the league came outside the first round. Sure, but you know, the the one thing that also I was thinking about based on the conversation we had is, and this is not discussed enough. Why was it that those fourth, fifth, sixth round quarterbacks thrived? And I guarantee you the environment is the common theme. Various strands in the spider web. But so the point is, though, always, if, if you want to, though, have success, if you want to be the latest team to get a fourth or a fifth round quarterback and make it work, you've got to look at what's around the quarterback currently and whether or not you could duplicate what the Russell Wilson's in Seattle, the Dak Prescott's in Dallas is, San Francisco, Brock Purdy, Tom Brady in New England. If your house is not in order, Paul, it's going to be very hard for you to become the latest success story. That's my point. The Giants have gone that route with the project quarterback before. They've drafted Davis Webb. They've drafted Kyle Loletta. Right, well, they drafted look Ryan Nassib. They those drew, guys, though. Well, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Over the course of time, they did go and try to get project quarterbacks, and for whatever the reason, okay. And I still think in Davis Webb's case, he just never had a chance. He even went to a couple other organizations. Yeah, he was well, always I mean, behind the number of one those pick. Guys, in fairness, never you really know, had much of an opportunity. I I don't think that Nassib really ever developed into anything very much. He, he never never did anything in the league, and Loletta didn't either. Well, and also when okay. Eli Manning's in front of you, you're probably never going to get on the field anyway. Well, again, that's yeah. why I look at Davis and I, I look at Davis Webb, and you know he was behind Donald with the Jets. He was behind Josh Allen with the Bills. And then he comes back here, and he's behind Daniel Jones. <laughs> so he never got a chance. I still think Davis Webb could have been a good quarterback in this league. I still believe that. And the one game that he played, he showed he had something to offer. But the other guys, no. I mean, they they really never had even a flash. So when you take a project in the middle of the draft, well, you have to understand that the project may or may not give you anything. There's a chance. Well, and even, and I think this name came up yesterday because we were talking about the injuries across the league. Jake Browning, who stepped in for Joe Burrow last season. Browning was on several teams, including the Vikings. You know, never really had much of an opportunity. All of a sudden, his number is called in Cincinnati. He seems to be a good fit for what Zach Taylor is running Mm -hmm. from an offensive standpoint. And Browning had several good starts. Now, that doesn't mean that Browning is going to replace Burrow in Cincinnati. But that's why I go back to the environment and the team and the play caller shapes the trajectory of the quarterback. So this idea that everybody can find somebody in the later rounds, all the examples that you gave, Paul, I'm not disputing that. But what I'm saying is... The rationale behind why those quarterbacks panned out was that the fit was good and the talent around that player was even better. Well, in Kerry Collins' case, he had been spit out by a couple of organizations. He had a lot of personal demons and a lot of things that had derailed him after one good year in Carolina where he actually made the playoffs. And so he's on the scrap heap. And Ernie Acorsi is like, well, let me do my research. I'll call up Paterno, his Penn State buddy. Let me call him up. Let me let me see. What what's the report on this guy? What's what's the background on this guy? Why did it all fall apart for him? And what happens? Only of course he picks him up off the scrap heap. The Giants put him in a in a uh, a character building program. He changes his entire life. Totally does a a one eighty, and and becomes a model citizen with the Giants' help and counseling, and all of that first round talent that had come out of college wound up showing up on the field. Sure. And he gets the Giants to a Super Bowl. I well, mean... He was also a very high pick, though, in fairness. No yeah. doubt. No doubt. But my point is, yes, circumstances absolutely have a huge impact, no matter how good the guy may or may not be, as to what he finally becomes. And that's why I'm just saying you've got to think about that through the Giants' lens, that if they do go the route of taking a quarterback in the fourth or the fifth round, A, you got to be realistic in terms of the chances of that individual getting on the field 
sooner rather than later, and B, if they were called into duty, are the elements around that quarterback strong enough right now for them to come in and produce? And I think right now there's question marks that remain in that department simply based on the results from last season. To to finish that thought, Kurt Warner. Nobody wanted him. The Giants signed him for a year as the stopgap to basically mentor Eli Manning. Okay, Manning comes in. Manning is then given the keys to the castle. Giants were very honest with Kurt up front. It's a one-year deal. Season's over. Now he's back out on the street after showing people, yeah, I could still play in this league. He goes to the Cardinals and takes them to a Super Bowl. Sure. Well, he was, though, a previous Super Bowl MVP. I understand that, but he had been given up for nothing. Well, yeah, but... He was on the the garbage pile. He was done. Nobody wanted him. He had no offers. But Kurt's more of an example of the veterans that we're talking about, I think. The point being that the spider web has a lot to do with either a guy's success or, for that matter, the reclamation project that he may become. Sure. No, in terms of the numbers he put up in Arizona versus what he put up with the Giants. In fairness, though, and this, I think, gets overlooked on Kurt Warner's resume, especially with the Giants. Remember, the Giants were 5-4 and four with him as the starting quarterback oh, before I, Tom hey. Coughlin made the decision I know. to go to Eli. People forget that, that the Giants oh, have a I know. record. Yeah. I know. Hey, look. No, I know you know. There were just veterans that tends to get. There were veterans in misplaced. that locker room who were not happy I can only when imagine. that change was made because yeah. they thought that Kurt could get them to a wild card. But, but you know, Tom looked at it, and Kurt was holding the ball too long. The, the line wasn't holding up. He was taking too many sacks. Uh, he was also fumbling the ball a lot. And so Tom said, you know, I think best thing is let's get Eli's clock started. It turned out to be the right thing. The rest thing. is history. Yep. Let's head back to the phone lines. We check in with Rich in Virginia. What's happening, Rich? What do you got for us? Well, happy uh, countdown to free agency, Godfather, Dettino, and Lance. Uh, great <laughs> off-season coverage as usual. It's uh, very entertaining to listen to all the speculation. But the um, question for you guys is, um, worst-case scenario, we lose Saquon and McKinney in free agency, among others. What's the deal now on comp, comp, comp picks? Would we get comp picks? This year, if we lose them... No, that gets factored into the following 25? year. Yeah, Rich, that gets factored 25? when you lose a free agent that goes towards the following year. Right. Yeah. Spring of spring of 25. Yeah. What uh, what draft position? Because I remember it's usually third, correct? No, well, no, no. It, it, there's a formula. We don't know how those computations are going to pan out because you also remember have to factor in who you sign and who you bring in offsets what you lose. Yeah. If there's a scale, and yeah. you have to balance the scale, and it depends on what comes out and what goes in. And the other thing is, you mentioned third round. The reason you mentioned that is because the rule is you cannot have a compensatory pick after the first or second rounds. Compensatory picks only come into play in the NFL at the end of the third round. That's the highest you yeah. can go. But you can get multiple picks. Sure, but you can't assume where they're going to be until they determine whatever the mathematical formula is. Nobody publicly knows because they don't reveal that. So you can't make assumptions based on what happened in previous years that it's going to apply to following years. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, Keep up the great work. Appreciate the phone call. Good day. Not a problem. Yeah, I wouldn't get too ahead of ourselves in terms no. of compensatory picks for 2025. Let's get through 2024 first, and then we can digest. <laughs> it's going to happen in uh, 2025. All right, let's uh, head back to the phone lines. We got Diana in Myrtle Beach. Diana, welcome to the program. What do you got for us? Hey, thank you guys so much for taking my call today. I really appreciate it. Hi. Hi. I wanted to talk a little bit about Saquon Barkley, and I wanted to give myself a chance to actually breathe and really digest what was happening uh, before I called in. Um, I heard Joe Shane, I believe it was, say that he was valuing the running back position, and it's almost like buying a house where you have to look at comps. And I, I think that upsets me a little bit because Saquon Barkley is not, the running back position. He's a person. He's a person who brings energy to the sidelines. He's a person who's exemplary on and off the field. 
She is a person that uh, brings effort, um, unlike maybe some other people. Um, he's a person that's great in the locker room, that's a good teammate. Um, and as a fan, um, obviously I don't know a lot of the inner workings that happens, but I'm just not understanding how the value of somebody who is a weapon, just not a player, but a weapon is not given the franchise tag or is allowed to, uh, you know, be a free agent. And I'm, I don't think I'm really understanding that because as a fan who's suffering through a great many seasons um, that have not been so well, to see players like Xavier McKinney and Barkley out on the open market, when, when does the brass say, hey, we got to really start keeping some good players and we have to value not just the position but the player in the position? Well, fair questions. I, I think with respect to Saquon Barkley, you know, we don't know what conversations went on, Diana, before they ultimately decided not to tag him. But remember, based on how things played out last season, he was tagged. They did a reworked one-year deal. It may have been possible that they came to a point where they said, Saquon, you know, out of respect to you, we want you to go out. We want you to see what the market's like. And then if you could then bring us perhaps your best offer – we'd like to have the opportunity to match. It's possible that those conversations happen. I'm just throwing out a hypothetical, and I think that may get lost, Diana, in terms of what you're looking at. It's not that they don't value him. It's that actually it's a form of valuing him by not wanting to lock him up and deprive him an opportunity from getting towards his highest potential earning power. And that is, you can argue, a form of respecting the player and allowing the market to dictate how things play out. And remember, Joe Shane has said that his um, equation, if you will, for valuing a player goes across the board. He wasn't just talking about running backs. He was talking about free agency in general. When, When he does contracts, that's his M.O. That's how he handles things. It's always looking at the comps. And most teams do that in this league. There'll there'll be some, I'm sure, that may go a little bit awry of that for their own quirks or whatever it is that they feel their gut. But but that's the standard way to do it. And I think that's pretty much the case in most businesses, quite frankly. Now, the other thing is, Joe Shane has also gone out of his way to say that he wants Saquon Barkley back on this team. So I don't. I don't sense any disrespect here at all. In fact, if anything, it was Barkley at the end of the season who said to the Giants that very thing to, to the media when he spoke and said, look, I really don't want to hear about a tag again. You know, let's talk. Let's see what happens. I, I, it, almost, it almost sounded like he would have been offended if they had tagged him again. Now, maybe the Giants decided, you know what? We had a good, uh, we had a good resolution to what happened last year after we ripped up the tag and signed him to a new one-year deal. Maybe, just maybe, the Giants are not only thinking and saying what you said, but maybe also part of that is we don't want to make this contentious. You know, Barkley already went through a little bit of a rocky road last year when we had to tag him. There's no sense in, in making this any more abrasive than it has to be, especially if he's being up front with us and we're being up front with him. Let's try to do a deal on good faith. And I totally understand that, and that's why I wanted to call in, because I want to make sure that I'm getting all perspectives, especially hearing what you guys have to say. Again, as a fan, um, I just want to see our team truly be the best it can be. I want to be able to attract talent to our team. And a good way to attract talent to your team is when you already have good players. Yeah. Um, on the team, and then other players say, hey, you know, Joe Shane values Saquon. He values McKinney. He values a lot of these other players, and that's how we're going to build a good nucleus, especially with a lot of young people. Um, I am a very big fan of Daniel Jones, and I hope uh, they mean what they say, that he will be the starter for us. I mean, I agree we have to add a quarterback to the quarterback room, But I believe that our offensive line has been so porous for a great many years, it really is difficult to evaluate some of these players and what their potential could have been 
had we had better run blocking or better pass blocking. Yeah. So I'm just looking at it as a fan from that perspective. All right, Diana, and appreciate the phone call. Thank you. But remember, the key is you can only wait so long to say this is going to be the year that the offensive line comes together. I know. In this business, you have to evaluate guys even under circumstances that are not ideal. You know what's interesting, though? The one year that Daniel Jones had a functional offensive line to work with and had the running back that he needed to balance out the attack, well, he took them to the playoffs and won a road playoff game. Okay? The one chance that he had to actually have a fair opportunity to succeed, and he did. And I might add, by the way, with a wide receiving room that was ravaged. Well, that's why the running game was so critical that year. I mean, James was the leading receiver that season. Did, did, did we forget that? Hodgins also had a very good year once he well, came along. Well, he came along the yeah. second half of the season and he helped yeah. him out. But, but... You know, James was a kick returner. He wasn't even supposed to be part of the passing game, and he wound up leading the the club in receptions. The wide receiving room was an absolute mess. But with a functional line and a legitimate running back, Daniel Jones got him nine wins and got him a road playoff victory. So the one year that they gave him a spoon... To eat the soup. You like the food analogy, right? It's tremendous. They gave him a spoon to eat the soup instead of a fork, and he was able to eat it without spilling it on himself. That's all I'm saying. Well, but once again, I think then it further proved, though, the following year, can that be sustained, though? And I'm sure the Giants were asking themselves. Well, they went went back to giving him not just a fork. They gave him a toothpick. True, but also the running game wasn't nearly as effective as it was the previous year. Running game went down, offensive line went down, receiving core still wasn't really where it needed to be. Which means if you take some of those items away, obviously you're going to impact the quarterback, but also it goes back to you can't assume that that's going to be able to be duplicated year in and year out. So when the running game is not clicking, can the quarterback still make plays that can help overcome some of the other issues? You know, that's the game that every team I'll change the analogy. He finally had a car with four wheels, and he drove it to where it had to go, to the playoffs. Every other year of Daniel Jones' career, he's been stuck with a car that had no more than three wheels. Some years it had only two. Well, and he also hasn't stayed healthy, too. I mean, that's the other factor that no we bring up. So, once again, a lot of factors. I, I think just going back to what the caller said about respecting players, it's not so much the Giants and Saquon Barkley on an island. I think what's happening is a reflection of, once again, the running back market. I mean, think about, Paul, all the other well, sure. running backs that are hitting the market. Derrick Henry and Tennessee, okay? They could go their separate ways. The Cowboys didn't tag Tony Pollard for the second straight year. Josh Jacobs is going to hit the market with the Raiders. Austin Eckler is a free agent. Now, if you looked at all those players, they're all different in terms of their skill set, but I would say several of them are weapons, like Saquon Barkley, mm-hmm. not just running backs. So why isn't it that those teams didn't tag their respective players. I mean, you can interpret it the same way and say, aren't they disrespecting their talent? And I would say, no, it's more of a matter of these front offices are seeing this running back market, not get a lot of money, and you have to play the game of economics. When you are putting a team together, the general manager in an ideal world, yes, they're human beings, you want to personalize things, but good businesses looking at it through the X's and O's lens and not getting caught up on some of the other elements that don't always necessarily overly influence the outcome of football games. Football-wise, at least the people that I respect out at the Combine all agreed. Saquon Barkley, strictly from a football X's and O's perspective, is worth more to the Giants than he is somebody else. Well, and he also knows the system. so That too. Yeah. There's comfort level, leadership, and all that other stuff. Sure. I think Joe Shane also knows that. And that, to, the, to the, uh, the caller who called a few moments ago, that's also part of it. Joe, Joe probably in his own mind thinks it's also a pretty good bet that all the outside suitors realize, you know, he's worth more to us than he is somebody else. 
So they probably won't bowl him offer uh, over with an offer. I understand that because the, the market's flooded with some very, very good players who are top shelf backs in their own right. And on the flip side, you could say, okay, well, you have other options if, God forbid, you lose Saquon Barkley, though you would argue if you're not going to re-sign Barkley, hard to believe they would then invest more money in another similar veteran running back. That doesn't necessarily add up. No. But there are options on the market who may not cost as much. But the other thing that you were pointing out is it's saying we're not going to bid against ourselves. We're going to let the market dictate right. things, even with a guy like Saquon Barkley. And that's good economics. That's what I'm getting at. I understand the last caller brought up the human element. And in an ideal world, we wish everybody looked at the human element, not just in sports, in business too. But when you're dealing with a salary cap and you have limitations, sometimes that human element has to take a back seat. It's not a cold view of the world. It's just the reality. You can't always say you're going to give somebody X amount of dollars because they're a good presence in the locker room. Not every team has the luxury to be able to throw that type of money around. And I think that's the big challenge for most teams. Let's head back to the phone lines. We got Mike in Virginia with us here on BBKO. What's happening, Mike? What do you got for us? Hey, how y'all doing? Uh, I just happened to call in. I missed the uh, first caller, so uh, I might. I guess I might be going over some of the stuff he brought up already about with Barkley. Um, I mean, my personal opinion, I don't think, like, you, you do have the market, and I understand that, and I understand the business aspect of it. But Barkley, in my opinion, is not a market kind of player. You get so much more. I mean, how can you downplay a person that literally may touch the ball just as much as the quarterback plus, plus his receptions? Yeah, I mean, again, well, that's why he's a weapon. Bar- Bar- we're saying he's a weapon. Barkley yeah. is not a running back. He is a weapon, and he means more to the Giants than right. he does any other team. I am so on board with you, and I don't want to speak for Joe Shane. It's not my place to do it. So I will say this. Right. I suspect this. I won't state it as a fact, but I suspect this. If there were no salary cap, this would not even be an issue. Well, I mean, because Saquon Barkley oh, so would have been re-signed in a heartbeat, I mean, right? Well, Paul, you can apply that logic to all well, one other teams too. No, well, because <laughs> no, not every team wants every one of their free agents back. No, but they feel pretty good right, about right, having the right. ability to keep you know. But this, but but, but, but this is a guy. This is a guy they want back. Well, well it's it's uh, I think I I just hope that they're not trying to overthink it. Where okay, the market dictates because at some point. Like, just like y'all always say, it's a business, right? So in some businesses, some people go out and they'll spend extra money to make their business better than what they're already, where they're already at. They'll invest it in somebody to come in and, uh, well, I forgot what's the term, but like, um, what a consultant, up, um, a consultant. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. But they'll pay that extra money, right? For a consultant to make their business better. So I use that in comparison with Barkley. You got to pay that extra money for Barkley. He's not a market player, in my opinion. He's not like Christian McCaffrey's not. These are players that will change your team. You just have to build around them correctly. Well, but, but see, but you need to have the money have and the ability to build around them, though, too. Keep that right, in mind, right. Mike. I mean, but, any but now, money okay, you use so, on the running back position or the weapon position, then you take away from bringing in those other resources. And that's also something the Giants need to weigh. If we put X amount of dollars in point A, Do we have enough for B, C, D, and so forth? Or can we be more economically friendly with position A, which gives us more flexibility for B, C, and D? Well, my argument to that, right, would be, what if, like, yes, everything changes within a year, but last year, what they offered him last year, why why would it go down from there? Well, because in, in fairness, though, Saquon's now a year older. He's got more right. mileage on his tires. I mean, I think that's basic common he, he sense. He did have another that, sprained ankle. Correct. I mean, it, of course, is going to change from that standpoint. You know, what, when, mean, the, when they ripped up the tag last year, right, right. the new one-year deal that was agreed to with his agent was very simple. Here's the deal, and we're going to build in incentives that if you pass last year's stats, you'll get some more money. Well, right. I, I'll be frank with you. I can't think of a more fair way to do a deal than to say to somebody, do what you did last year, do better, you get more. (laughs) I mean, what's wrong with that? And so I would do the same thing this year. 
the deal that I would offer him, whatever the base deal is, okay, that the Giants think is fair or any team thinks is fair, I would also add incentives onto it and say, Saquon, if you play 17 games, if you catch so many passes, if you run for more yards than you did last year or break 1,000, you'll get incentive money. I'll even give you per okay. game appearances as as a potential incentive for trying to play 17 games this year. I would do all of that. Like to, so that if he, if he does all those things, he gets more. Uh-huh. What's wrong with that? What do, what do you think that um, – well, what's going on now with the salary cap and running backs base would probably be this year for running backs. Is it you think nine to ten or ten to eleven? What do, what do you Joel think? Corey of CBS Sports, who was a longtime NFL agent and I think is the best in the business at analyzing all of this stuff, uh, has told me, and then he also mentioned it to John Schmelk for the Huddle program, that uh, there will not be any free agent running back in this class that gets more than $10 million guaranteed on an annual basis. Woo. Oh, man. That's his impression based oh. on the market. Okay? That's his oh, impression man. based on the market. Okay. That none of these guys is going gonna, is gonna to get more than $10 million guaranteed a year. That's Joel Corey's opinion. I'll be frank okay. with you. He's a heck of a lot more of an expert at this salary cap stuff than I will ever be. Right. So when he says that, I'm going to put a lot of stock in it. Yeah. Now that doesn't mean so you do can't you, think, you can't give someone incentives that could get them over ten. Right. That that you could right. do that, but in terms of the base and the guarantee, that well, that was his number. Now, okay, I I was a real estate agent, right? And one thing my branch manager told me. And he said, you don't allow certain numbers to, to change a de- to, to X out a deal if it's a good deal. Right? So okay. if it's ten if it's ten million, right, is Barkley honestly worth two more to get that deal done? In my opinion, well it depends on what else though, once again, you need on your team. I, I think the reason why Mike other businesses are not good examples in this conversation is there's no salary cap in exactly. the real estate. Right. business okay so if you can get a little bit more out of the budget or you can move money around that's doable the nfl you're not allowed to do that there is an end all sure. be all number so i don't love the analogies when you bring in other industries joe shane and the giants don't have the same flexibility they can't get a donation of five million dollars to then give two of it to saquon it drastically changes the conversation you know two million so. bucks could get you even two veteran players on a one-year minimum. Sure. I mean, right. that's how that's yeah. how important $2 million can be to a general manager. Again, though, what's so bad about you give them the number that Joel was quoting and then say, all right, you got incentives that could be worth another million or two. What's so wrong with that? Right, right. Uh, guaranteed money. I, I know that's a big deal. With this I, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's always deal. a, it's, it's always really a big deal. deal. <laughs> it's always yeah. a big deal. Well, I, I get it. Um, uh, I don't want to touch too much on that one. I also want like um, I, I really just I hope we can we we got some money to play with this year. Um, you know, let's try to get a lineman, uh, guard, um, and we need that wide out man. We really need that wide out yeah. that can can change the game. Yep. Um. I hope we can do something with McKinney. Um, but at the end of the day, man, hey, I'm a Giants fan through and through. I'm going to rock with him through the tough times. and you know, I hear you. All right, my call, fellas. Yep, appreciate the Good call. phone call. Thank you so much. I mean, you look at the running back numbers, financially speaking, across the board, and I brought up Miles Sanders last season who wound up getting about $6 million per year when he signed with the Carolina Panthers. I mean, that was the going rate. So teams realize that, and that's why I think there's been a hesitancy to invest in this position. And we could sit here and talk about their weapons versus running backs, but let's face it. If you bring up the highest paid running back slash weapons in the NFL, Christian McCaffrey's really on an island all by himself. Mm -hmm. I know Jonathan Taylor recently got a deal from the Indianapolis Colts, but fully guaranteed money, just to give you an idea, McCaffrey's at 30 million, Taylor's at 19. There's a significant difference yeah. between that and Alvin Kamara is another guy who recently got a decent contract. His fully guaranteed money was just over seventeen million. Very different from McCaffrey at thirty, and then everybody else pretty much falls into line. So the market is being utilized to dictate 
how things are going to play out yep. at that position. And that's pretty much the best way to sum it up. And I think that's been the mindset of teams, not just this year, but across the board over the last few seasons. All right, that is going to wrap up Friday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live. Today's episode, part of the Giants platforms everywhere and Giants.com slash podcast. For Paul Dottino, I'm Lance Meadow. Enjoy the weekend as the festivities will get going on Monday with the start of free agency. You can stay locked to BBKL right here at 1230 p.m. Eastern. Have a good one.